everyone, and welcome to New Consciousness Review. I'm Miriam Knight, and our guest today is Didinard Napatalong, known to her students and followers as Master Didinard, a renowned Thai spiritual teacher and philanthropist. She earned master's degrees in economics and business administration from the University of London, and at the age of 25 started her own diamond business. But by the age of 27, she was left a widow with an 11-month-old baby and $3 million in debt. She dove into the practice of mindfulness meditation and within two years was able to pay off all of her debt. Finding a new calling, she has spent the past 16 years teaching mindfulness and mind management through classes, retreats, and charity events and this profound transformation led to her book, The Compass of Now, which has sold more than 1.4 million copies in her native country. Welcome, Master Didi Nard. I'm so delighted you could join us. Hi, Miriam. I'm so delighted talking to you now. You know, I really enjoyed reading your book. It just distills the wisdom that you gained from such challenges that it, they would have crushed most people. Uh, you came to London on your own to study, and the experiences you had even then just were so um, crushing. Uh, crushing is really the only word I can think of. How did you find the resources, even as a young girl, to just keep on going? Yeah, and actually, when um, bad things happen, I found that I was too busy solving the problem rather than being miserable about it. So I, since I was young, I really enjoy um, solving all the things that happens in front of me. So I thought we might, as, we all might as well keep ourselves busy uh, solving the problems rather than thinking about it. <laughs> So, the book that came out of your story, you know, I just kind of gave our listeners the, the tip of the spoon of your story. Can you flesh it out a bit more for us? What, yes. what led to your leaving the business world and moving exclusively onto the spiritual path? Yes. Okay, um, 18 years ago, on the morning of New Year's Eve, I actually took my 11-month-old son. Uh, we flew to Phuket, the beautiful island of Thailand, in order to meet my husband, who runs um, real estate business and hotel there. But then um, we learned the news that he had just passed away that night. And um, the moment I heard it, it was a um, New Year song around... Uh, in my ears and um, when my mother came up to me and said uh, you don't need to go to meet your husband anymore he has just passed away I I couldn't believe it and I told my mom that this is not funny my son is less than one year old and how would he grow up without his father but then I learned that it was true so at that minute I actually collapsed but my son he stood up on his feet for the first time hugged me and wiped away my tears. At that moment, I just realized that we as an adult, when we face some challenges, we actually keep banging our head to the wall, asking the wrong question like, why this is happening to me? But instead, the child did not ask why it happened to him, even though he lost his father. Instead, he asked how could he make it better, especially for his mom. So at that moment, it's like it came as a flash to me that I, I should be asking the right question. How can I make it better to be a better mom and dad for my little baby? But then when we walked to the funeral, it turns out that there were so many creditors there and they were banging, they were like asking for three million dollars back, which I had none to give it back to them. What I found so fascinating was when you kind of surveyed your situation, 
you really focused in on what was important and what was not important. You kind of flesh that out for our listeners because that was so profound. Yes. And, um, well, for, to, to me then, there were, there were things that came, um, and helped. And I'm just hoping that the message that we are talking now will save someone who are listening. They might be, they might have just lost their loved ones or lost their jobs, lost their business or having their friends talking bad behind their back. Whatever their problems is, um, I would like to tell them that it will, it will go away. This too shall pass. At that moment, um, 18 years ago, all I was hoping to hear was that things shall pass. But luckily, there was one gentleman, which I hardly knew him, walked up to me and said, you know what? Um, there was one mother. She lost her son. And then she was carrying her son's body and asking for help. And the Buddha said to her that if you can find a house where ne- uh, which never lose their loved ones, I will help your son. That moment, the words that was lingering in my ears were a house that never lose their loved ones. It's like it came to me so clearly for the first time that we all hear that people lose something dear all the time. It doesn't bother us until it's become us, ours, our loved ones. It's like <clears throat> that moment I felt that the word I, me, mine is so powerful in causing all of us suffering. And I saw that how how I create the suffering to myself is that my mind actually reached out and hold it to the situation that I want it to be this way. My son must have a father. And it's like every time each of us doing that, wanting the things to be our way, the way we want it, we create uh, the pain in our heart unnecessarily. Indeed. Yes. Yes. Um, You then uh, undertook a retreat um, in meditation. How did that change you? Oh, somebody um, told me at the funeral that if you want to gain control of your life, you, if you can master your mind, you can master your life. I had nowhere to go. I didn't know what to do. At that time, um, I didn't know anything about meditation. I actually told the person who told me that, that okay, meditation is only for people who have nothing to do, but I have lots of things to do. I'm not going to go to meditate. But then with no options left for me, I, I turned to meditation, but I couldn't do it. The first minute I sat down, it was like Julia Roberts in the Eat, Pray, Love movie. I couldn't stand it even for longer than one minute. But then at that point, I thought, okay, I cannot just run away from this. So what I could do, I just observed the pain as it is. And it was like an enlightening moment. I saw the pain separated from me. It's like the pain belongs to somebody else, not on my legs. At that time, I, I knew the freedom for the first time, that if the pain that is so real to me can feel like it belongs to someone else, then death can, death can be just death, and my mind is my mind. Challenges can be just challenges, and my mind can stay free and happy. And while I was observing it freely, that I don't care how the pain goes, the pain just disappear. It's like the secret of the universe um, um, manifested that when you don't try to push things out of your life, it disappear on its own. It's like when you have debts, you keep praying that, oh, I hope this problem will go away. But anytime you want something to go away, it only increases. But when you don't mind and you can coexist with something, it actually disappears on its own. And at that time, with all the debt I had, I knew that I can pay up all my debt easily. And I, I feel the state of abundance and, 
and I feel I have everything then. So afterward, I paid off all my debt with that feeling. It's like after I came out of that meditation, um, I, whatever um, comes to me, even while I was sitting in my uh, house lawn and the wind blow and touches my skin, I felt very happy and I said, oh, I'm so happy. My sister said, look, you owe $3 million debt and your husband just passed away and your son has no father. But I felt happy and I know then that only happiness bring more happiness. But um, before that, I didn't know. I thought if something bad happened to you, you deserve to feel bad. But then I just realized that if you feel bad, you cannot make good decisions. You only make bad decisions with unhappy mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The name of your book is The Compass of Now. And there are kind of two elements in that very short title. One is now, the, the present moment, which you just alluded to, that now in the present moment you were feeling happy, you were feeling the breeze on your face. And then the compass, which is the way that you direct your thoughts, that you direct your life. Can you expand upon the compass? How do you use that internal guidance system? Yes, actually, it is your self-awareness. Um, everything we human do, from breathing to moving around, finding our loved ones, uh, finding material things or status, fame, power, or everything, we do that in order to have happiness. But um, without knowing how to be happy, one may not reach it ever all their life. And I found that being happy is just to come back to yourself right this present moment. Even now that we are talking or our listeners are listening to us, if they come back to your, their mind, it's like we have an island of happiness right inside us. We have our true home inside of us. And any time we, we want, we can always come back to it. And when we come back to it, we stop searching, we stop looking for happiness. And that's when, that's, and only that when the happiness manifests in our heart, in our life. So um, whatever you do, actually most people may think that being mindful is difficult or you have to close your eyes and find a very quiet place in order to sit down. But actually you can do, you can be mindful with everything you do, even while you're listening to me or while I'm talking to you, you're just being aware of your thoughts, your feelings. And you can see your thoughts and your feelings as if it belongs to someone else. Why? Because once you can see it as an observer, you are free from your thoughts and your feelings. Because um, I had a lot of uh, problems at that time. I could not allow myself to be consumed by my sadness or my misery. So I just pull myself back and just watch whatever arises. It just passed away. Arising, passing away, arising, passing away. It's, um, Mariam, do you notice that at, uh, today it's like the fashion that people want to create good thoughts like, oh, I will have a parking lot, I will have a parking space where mm -hmm. I'm driving to or I'm, I'm having a diamond necklace and all that. But I feel that if you, if you try to push away your, your bad thoughts, it will be increased. Because whatever you put your energy on, it, it, will, it will manifest more in your life. And also, on the other hand, if you're thinking of something from the point of that you're lacking, like if you want diamond necklace, you, you don't have it and you want it, that means you are thinking of it from the point of view that you don't have. So that creates more inadequacy. Yes, I think that message is starting to kind of trickle out into the consciousness, but it still has a way to go. The other um, challenge that we have as human beings is overcoming this feeling of a victimhood. You know, why me? Why did this happen to me? And you make such a good point that it really is our choice whether we want to feel a victim. 
to, to talk about freedom and, and freedom to choose. Yes, um, I, I like your question because actually the the question why me is true out a frame of um, the way you build the world. But I feel that things happen to take our life to the best position always. If you actually build the world as the way it is, things happen to, to help us elevate. It, it doesn't want any of us to be common or ordinary. It wants us to excel. It wants each of us to be the best. And if we think about it, all the things that happened to us in the past actually contribute to where we are today. All the good things that you, me, and the listeners are having today, all the great things we have, many of them um, came up from the part where it was part time in our life, actually. And um, yes, so things things happen, but as a human, we are different from animals. Animals are consumed by their thoughts and feelings, and they have to act upon their feelings and thoughts. But we humans have a very unique uh, quality. It is the quality that we can just be an observer of our thoughts and feelings. It was what happened to me then that I, be, I just realized for the first time that, oh, the university never taught me that I can be free even from my own thoughts. And if once you learn how to be free from your thoughts, you can conquer anything because your suffering is not you anymore. All the bad thoughts or bad feelings cannot consume you anymore. You can just sit back and look at it as if it belongs to someone else. Especially today in the state, there are so many people feeling depressed or under a lot of stress. If you try, if you try to push the stress away from your mind or the depression away from your life, it will only get worse because you're putting your energy into it. And whatever you put your energy into it, it only expands. So um, I would say that with the, uh, the stress that I had, I did not um, try to get rid of the stress. I just wash it as a friend that, okay, it arrives and it just disappears. When you don't mind that it's coexisting with you, it disappears so quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know that you were trained both in NLP and in hypnosis. In fact, you're, you're a certified trainer. Um, that uh, dissociation is, is a technique that I know uh, is used in hypnosis, um, and it's very effective. Just just allowing it to wash away, wash over you. Um, the, one of the things that I so enjoyed in the book uh, was your use of like folk stories, um, the the story that you mentioned about the Buddha and, and uh, uh, carrying the dead son, the story, uh, the stories that you mentioned about the monkeys and, and so on. One of one of the most powerful metaphors I found in your book was the metaphor of the glass. Um, sizing the glass to to your own situation. Please, please tell our listeners about that. I think it's just so useful. Yes, um, there were times that people uh, kept asking me why I was so happy with all the debts and, and everything that came up because as you know, when you having one problem, the other problems tend to be presented to you as well. Uh, like people talking bad about you and things like that. But then um, I I felt very, very happy with uh, what I had. But uh, the way I explain it is that normally when you have a, a glass of water and you have the water to half a glass, and people may say that, okay, uh, if you look at on the brighter side, you have half glass of water and the pessimistic, pessimistic people might say that uh, your water has gone for half a glass. But my view is that maybe the glass is too big. If you um, reduce the size of the glass to half or to a quarter, then you have too much water in your life. So the, the technique is that you reduce your need, your desire 
to match with what you have there, like reducing the glass, and then you will always feel that you have more than you need any time in your life. And you actually uh, applied this uh, in very practical terms. When you were in debt, you just sold off all of your possessions uh, that you could, and you repaid the debt. Um, and yet you were happy because you were st staying within your means. This is um, a kind of sickness in our society today that we feel that we need possessions to make us happy. Um, can you speak to that point? Yes. Um, actually, at that time, when I, when I just sold anything I have at any price, people came up to me and said that, no, you're going to lose all your money if you sell at whatever price the buyer offer. But I saw it the other way around, that if you are greedy and you want to make more money, you will only have debt and um don't make anything. But when you just let go and um, you just said, okay, I'm fine with whatever I get, the universe actually turned to be on your side. And I actually made money then. And what is more is that um, in order for you to be successful in anything in your life, it needs to begin with the in your inner state of mind that you feel that you have enough. So, um, we all need to start enjoying what we have and appreciate what we're having. And I, I felt very rich then, even though I had uh, $3 million debt. I felt very rich in terms of my son was always next to me, my family was next to me. I can watch the, the sunrise every morning. And I have families and friends. So the, the more you appreciate the things you have, um, the good thing manifests more in your life. And um, while, but I do understand why people think possessions are necessary to them. Those are the times when their hearts are dried and they don't feel the happiness. The more you feel painful and you go out and reach for more possessions, you only feel, um, it only hurts you more and you feel lack, more lucky along the way. I, I always like to tell the story of um, the monkey and the peanuts. It's how the farmers in, in Thailand catch the monkey who comes and, and destroy their crops. They will bring a coconut and then cut off the top of the coconut, put some peanuts in, and the monkey will come and put their hands into the coconut and grab the peanuts. Once it's grabbed the peanuts, it cannot take its hand out of the coconut, and it's got stuck. So we human always laugh at the monkey that it's so stupid. All it has to do is just to let go of the peanuts and it can be free. But I feel that we as a human, we often uh, grab onto our desire so strongly that we don't let ourselves out of the problems that we have. Each and every one of us who are listening right now, whatever you feel stuck, it's only your thoughts that is preventing you from getting out of the problem. There is nothing else. There are always answers to every situation you are facing. It's just that you don't see it now or you don't want to choose it. You gave another metaphor of grasping the rose with the thorns and holding on to our pain. That's another good lesson. Yes, it's, um, it's like the way I saw how my mind worked is that there were, there were, I, while I was trying to concentrate uh, solving my challenges, my mind kept running out and think about the people who hurt us. So I, I see that, have you ever been through the situation where some people may say bad things to you once or did something bad to you once, but you yourself keep thinking about it so many times that it hurts you more because of your thoughts, not because of their doing. So I felt that we actually take our thoughts like a knife to stab ourselves. And actually our mind works like we, uh, our mind is like a hand and reach out to grab a thought on action or words of other people and hold on to uh, the thorn that other people did. And we hold on it so tightly 
and no matter how painful we feel, we don't want to let go because we are unaware of what we are doing. Um, whoever are in pain right now, nobody has caused you the suffering. You actually do it onto yourself. You you hold on to some thoughts that hurt you. You are like you're holding onto the thorn in your palm, and it keeps hurting you until you are aware that. It's you yourself that are running that thoughts inside your head. The moment you're aware, you don't even need to let go because it will drop out of your head straight away by that moment. This is something that you mention a number of times that simply by observing a thought, you yeah. it's like you take the the sting out of it. You take the the, the electrical charge away from it, and then it no longer can impact you um, that is not necessarily intuitively true but um, why why does that work um, I, I, um, it's, it's like the fashion in the world during this time is that people try to push away their stress their anxiety and their worries but the more you try to let it go it's like you hold it on to something and the more you try to let it go, you you um, try it. The, the harder you try, the more it sticks onto your hand. And um, the harder you try to let go of it, it, it sticks to you more. But actually, how our mind works is that you just observe it or notice it that Okay, you're thinking that, and so what? I always say that it's like you are observing your thoughts like a snake that crawling past you. If you don't reach it and try to do something with it, those thoughts cannot harm you. You can smile to it and say, okay, I thought about that, and I thought this, I thought that. You, you don't have to grab it and bring it close to your heart. It disappears on its own. Mm -hmm. You talk a lot about greed, uh, which seems to be part of the human condition. But you talk about it um, also at the the national level. You gave a very poignant description of Thailand uh, before it became, quote, uh, developed or entered the circle of the developing countries. Um, and you also gave that very interesting, lovely story of the coffee vendor. Let's let you you do have two degrees in economics and business administration, so obviously you have a fine grasp of of uh, commerce and economics. Um, where are we going wrong? Yes, um, I do believe in uh, sustainable growth sustainable growth in, in all level, personal level or national level or at the world level. But at this time, at the moment, we are growing so fast that we are actually killing our world and killing ourselves. If you look at America today, um, it might be dangerous to say that in order to keep your financial market growing, you're printing a lot of money and you're keeping dollars very strong. With that, people in the banking industry and um, the financial, the stock market are making a lot of money. Whereas people who work in the factory will lose their jobs because American goods are no longer competitive in the world market. So you cannot sell anything from America. By doing that, that will result in most of the people in your country will lose their jobs. And the American dreams will never come true. So it also happened in the rest of the world, including Thailand. The way our country are managed is, well, we have to admit it that it's unfair. However, we cannot control the policy of each of our country, but we can make ourselves be uh, independent, that we can stand on our two legs, like we require less in order to be happy and that's where you become self-sufficient and you can make right decisions and you can make yourself happy and safe no matter what's happening at the national policy level. Please tell the story of the coffee. Uh, coffee man. 
Yes, because um, there were um, American guy um, went into the the um, floating market in Thailand, and he tested the coffee from one coffee man, and then he said, "Oh, your coffee is so good. Why don't you expand into branches around the world like Starbucks?" And the old man said, "Why would I do that?" Um, the American guy said, "So you will be rich. So you will make a lot of money." And the old coffee man guy said, um, "Then what do I do?" The American guy, tourist, said that. So when you're rich, you can uh, sit in the boat, ride along the canal, and singing your song happily. And the coffee man said, "What do you think I'm doing right now?" <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it's like. Um, All of us have what everything we need right in front of us. I I don't mind that we we make money, we become wealthy, or expand our business as long as our destination is along the way. It's like your happiness is being with you in everything you do, and you have you feel it's your everyday life is meaningful to you, not uh, in one or two or few years. I hate that you have to accomplish something first in order to be happy. That is unfortunately so true of our society: is postponing happiness. You know, burying ourselves in work, ignoring our families, and ignor- ignoring our relationships because we need to to buy the, the the new car or to pay the mortgage or to go on the holiday, and we. Don't stop to smell the roses and feel the breeze on our face. Yes, yes, we are being made to be incapable of feeling happy. Now, one of the elements of a good life that you describe in your book is finding joy in our work. Um, that is difficult for people to do. What advice would you have for them? Uh, I would say that you need a life mission to see that in every level that you do. Like, for example, if you see that your life impact the whole world, how you can make this world better. You see your life more than just your own needs, because all of us have the ability to do something that impact other people. Like, for example, the work that we do is the work of life. Uh, even though you are a bus driver, you, your la- your work is actually helping people to get to work or to get home safely without having to walk. If we see that, um, if we are a food seller and we see that our work is in order to make people life uh, be longer and be happier, and they can sustain their life in a healthy way, it has it puts more meaning into our life. It makes our life immediately happy, but at the moment, people are unhappy because they put uh, they associate their their work with the wages that they gain. So that means they will be happy only when they receive their salary or promotions. But actually, if you see that the true meaning of your work is to help somebody else feel better, then and only then that you. Ad- Your feeling of achievement every minute that you are working, and when you feel that your work is meaningful, you will never be tired. You just have all the energy to do everything you love at any time you want. How do we go about finding our purpose? Finding your purpose, actually, now, right now, that we are all talking and listening. If you come back to your true home inside your heart, your purpose is to be happy. Once you're happy now, you know that your happiness actually radiates throughout the whole world, and it's said it's actually organize your outer circumstances because your inner state actually dictates. It actually tells how the world should be treating you. So, what is more is that. If you're only interested in just making money for yourself, your inner will feel guilty and ashamed of your needs. That you only want to be rich for yourself only, so it will not allow you to be successful. But in uh, on the other hand, if you know that a good person like you 
if you are successful and very wealthy, you can help a lot of people. You can inspire people. You can help them, give them advice. You will do a lot of good cause into this world. It will allow you yourself, your inner self, will allow you to be successful. Because, um, like I mentioned earlier, the only thing that keeps us where we are is our thoughts, our mind. So, if your mind um, feel that it's right for you to accomplish something, your mind will uh, pave out the way. It will show you the path, and you will see the light everywhere you want to go. You will see tunnel on the walls. You see the path that no one ever walked before. Tell us about your charity work. Oh. Um, since um, since I have uh, paid off all my debt, I feel that I owe I owe it to the universe because someone that I didn't know actually came and and advised me on the darkest day of my life. So for the past eighteen years, I have been um, organizing happiness retreat for. Every time I organize the happiness seminar, it's for free. Five thousand people come to the seminar. And um, I take them to heal themselves, to forgive their parents, forgive themselves, and to be aware of their present moment, and go out and live their life mission. As well as the meditation retreat, um, we often do it in a mountainous resort where people come in for free and um, they stay there, have a beautiful accommodation and. Very lovely Thai food, and um, I tell them all these stories from the Compass of Now book, and they go out to be very aware of themselves, so they can live their life happily after. Are you going to be doing any of these retreats in the United States? Yes, I'm hoping to do that. Once um, there are more people learning more of my message, I feel that the Americans are ready. You, you people are very smart. You're good people, kind people, and you deserve to have all the good things in this world for you. Your country has done so much for the world, and it's about time that someone come in this time that um, you are ready for the, the the message that your true home is inside you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm curious. How old is your son now? My son is eighteen and a half, almost nineteen now. This is just a wild guess, but is he also a spiritual master? Uh, he is. He is actually. He does a lot of trading in the stock market, but he has been through all my all my me- meditation retreats. He knows all the story I tell, but he said. He he's using my teaching in order to make a lot of money, <laughs> <laughs> and he said that um, awareness is very important for businessmen because we won't know when we are too greedy or when we have fear. So I I I totally agree with him that while we are working people, we need to be aware of ourselves very much. It helps. Well, I think that's exactly the combination that we need to. Pull the the ship around to the the ship of the world. Um, people like your son who understand the limits um, of of putting putting limits on greed and injecting a sense of of uh, compassion and kindness and and uh, I guess responsibility into the business world because we're we're never going to be without the business world. But somehow the business world must change. Yes. Um, normally, in the past, we tend to see people that say that they are spiritual, but they are either sick or very poor and also unhappy. But I think that should be ended. You should see that people who who are being mindful, they are happy, very healthy, and very successful in all aspects of their life. We need more of that. Definitely yes. need more of that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, 
in fact, you you teach uh, mindfulness courses to uh, you know to, to businesses, don't you? To businessmen, yes, a lot of them. Actually, um, the more successful the people, the more they understand that they need to be more aware of themselves. Um, everybody who make it to the top knows that he needs to know what he's thinking very much. And a lot of um, I also teach a lot of poor people, and I know that they feel that um, they need to get over this problem first in order to be happy. So I teach them that that's not the way. Only and only if you are happy now, then you can get rid of the poverty that you are facing. And they follow that, and they become very happy now. What is the reception that you get in the prisons with your message? Very good. One point, actually, um, it used to be 1.4 million copies sold of the Composite Now, but today that I'm talking to you, it's 1.5 copies, uh, 1.5 million copies sold. So Very people good. from all walk of life, um, food vendor, um, taxi driver, bus drivers, up to the multi-billionaire. Yes. Well, I certainly recommend this book. It it is such a, a wonderful mixture of your story of, of deep wisdom, uh, and and leavened with all of these folk stories. It, it's you you just make it so accessible and so understandable. What message would you like to leave with our listeners? Um, I want to tell all of you that. The best thing are waiting for you. Whatever you see as a wall, it's actually a stair. It's just a big one. So you feel that it looks like a wall. But the bigger the stair, the higher it takes your life. The wisdom that you grow from uh, getting over it will help you all your life. We need to strengthen our mind in order to overcome whatever we are facing. And that with, with our mind elevated, it elevates our life in all dimensions. So uh, imagine your life in six months or one year from now. It gets better in every way and you will love it so much. Fix your mind to that picture and keep going. I'm there. <laughs> um, where do people go to find out um, about your retreats and, and to... Uh, get notified when you start having them in America? Uh, ddnart.com D-D-N-A-R-D ddnart.com uh, or um, the Compass of Now or the in the YouTube you can search for Compass Book Channel. Actually, I even though you don't buy a book, I have it all in the YouTube in the um, video and short films for everyone to learn how to overcome that in five minutes or to mend your broken heart in five minutes at once. <laughs> <laughs> now I understand why they call you a philanthropist. <laughs> We've been speaking with Master Didi Nard. She's the author of The Compass of Now. She's an amazing human being. Thank you so much for being with us today. And now we have a, what I think is a delightful bonus. Our guest is Dave Markowitz. I first met Dave after he came out with his book, Healing with Source, a spiritual guide to mind-body medicine. Dave is a medical intuitive who's helped thousands of people on their journey towards wholeness. And now he came out with a new book called Self-Care for the Self-Aware, a guide for highly sensitive people empaths, intuitives, and healers. So, welcome, Dave. Great to be here. Thank you so much. Dave, tell me, who qualifies as highly sensitive? Those that are usually know they are. What they don't usually know is that there are other people like them, or so many people like them. So basically, uh, anyone that gets affected by crowds really easily, by the energy of other individuals really e easily, gets overwhelmed, uh, seemingly overwhelmed by certain situations, uh, even those that are really sensitive to certain foods and medications, I found would be in that category. And what is the difference between just being highly sensitive and actually being an empath? Mm, great question. Highly sensitive is pretty literal. Uh, empath to me is someone that not only can 
take on, can feel the emotions and energy of other people, but also keeps it, which I've actually found to be very detrimental in many ways, leading to a lot of potential problems, even in the physical realm, where you can actually take on physical aches and pains of other people. You discovered that you were an empath in a rather amusing way. Can you tell our <laughs> listeners? Sure. I was invited to a friend of a friend's birthday party, and it was one of those party buses, uh, seven bars in seven hours. And not being a drinker, I certainly had my trepidation about it, but went anyway. And at the end of the evening, after having drank nothing but water the entire evening, I was drunk. And in the old days, they used to call it a contact high. But in that moment, I realized just how empathic I was. Even though almost everyone I knew and even didn't know was telling me that I was an empath for a very long time, that was my two by four to the side of the head where I realized I had taken on so much drunken energy, if you want to call it that, that I actually slurred my words and couldn't walk straight. And that's when I realized, yep, I am, I, I'm, I'm that. <laughs> I am the empath. And it took you a while to actually figure out this whole medical intuitive thing. How did you go about um, That was an uh, end result of a lot of different work, a lot of different awarenesses, a lot of meditation, a lot of speaking with really great people, a lot of reading books about medical intuition, to be able to even be open to the idea that uh, anyone, much less myself, was able to intuit what's going on with someone else without you know the name psychic attached to it or anything like that. Um, it became a lot more solidified, even though I did really well with that, and the first book does talk about that a little bit. Once this new book came out where I was really able to see that this intuitive ability was able to go so deep that I can actually figure out and share with someone that what they're dealing with may not be theirs in origin, and that was often the the real aha moment. That was the difference between success and not success because if we're dealing with something that's not someone's, and when treating it and addressing it or addressing the symptoms of such as if it is, at best, we're going to get temporary results. So the uh, answers that came to me in the meditation by working with a lot of people who identified themselves as empath was very different. I was able to give very specific tools using those medical intuitive abilities to people to really be able to work with things that each one of them have claimed to, I said to me that was, had been addressed in different ways, and now in a completely different way, one that actually got results and relatively quickly for a lot of people. Now, as a medical intuitive, you deal with a variety of people trying to help them with their physical problems. Out of the clients that you see, what percentage would you say were empathic and were actually dealing with stuff that was of an outside origin. Since that event where I realized I was empathic, the universe has set up things so beautifully that I would say, no exaggeration, about 99% of the people I work with are carrying something of someone else's. And they're just finding me. That's the amazing part. This is seems to be designed by something much greater than I. I, I would have no clue how to even begin doing such. <laughs> um, so, yeah, good 99%. So do you think it could be possible that as a species, as, as a society, we're actually developing greater empathy and becoming uh, you know, more connected with each other? I think so. Um, it's hard to say... 100% because I really only have privy to the people that I work with. And when it seems to be, you know, when it's 99%, it's really easy for me to say, well, everyone must be empathic. I do believe someone, that everyone has the capability of being such, but most because of difficult upbringings or war-torn countries or poverty or whatever it is, um, tend to close themselves off from that gift really early on. Uh, I'm sure you've met a lot of people that kind of wake up to the psychic gifts, you know, in their 30s and 40s. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, is kind of similar. I think a lot of us are born empathic. It kind of gets shut down because of the overwhelm of emotions that can come in at any given time. So overall, I like to think we're all waking up. But, you know, who am I to say what waking up actually looks like? So I just really deal with what it, the universe brings me in the moment. Can you give us a kind of encapsulated form of 
the self-care advice that you give in your book? I can do my best, sure. <laughs> um, there are five steps that the first two help prevent people from taking on aches, pains, even mental and spiritual pains and illness from other people. And I found those are really important because steps three and four are how to clear them. And they clear them in a very different way than what I've done, having experienced, learned, and even taught numerous, if not dozens, of healing modalities. It's very different. The main thing is the first two steps, which is the prevention, because steps three and four, sometimes you know you can go to a practitioner and get things cleared and you might feel really good. But if you don't really get to the underlying cause of the empathic ability and learn how to uh, recondition the self into using that so that it's a gift as opposed to a burden, then whatever you clear is typically, typically going to reform itself, sometimes in hours, sometimes in days. But using the first two steps, we set a really strong foundation for releasing in a very different way. And we also learn tools that I had never seen elsewhere doesn't mean they're not out there, but just that I haven't seen that are very different from the typical tools that are given to people who are empathic by beautiful, loving, well-meaning people. And maybe they get results with that, but I didn't. And that's one of the reasons why I think these new tools came to me. And everyone I work with that I share this with typically says I've never thought of it like that. And it's, it's quite an honor to be part of that team, that triune of bringing awareness to people so they can use the empathic skills as a gift as opposed to a burden. Mm -hmm. Well, I know my husband, who's a hypnotherapist, um, found your book quite fascinating and was reflecting on his own practice and mm. seeing where he was quite possibly taking on energies from other people. So I think it really does have a big audience among people who are healers of any kind. So do you have a kind of closing bit of advice for our listeners, Dave? Well, I think it's important to look at empathy as a gift and something that a lot of us are born into. And what I found was most of us, us especially in the new thought, new age, metaphysical communities, a lot of practitioners, like you mentioned, we really need to recondition ourselves and retrain ourselves to be able to take care of ourselves first. I think we need to retrain ourselves to be the divine vessels of unconditional love that I believe we are. But to, to share that love without really getting good at understanding how to work with the empathic gifts can be really draining and eventually leading to a lot of pain and illness. Mm -hmm. But with these tools, people are really shifting, not just releasing pains and illness, but really feeling okay with themselves, which to me is just as, if not even more important, learning that they're not the oddball, they're not the outlier. They may be different from the common person in their ability and abilities, um, but they're not so odd that there's something wrong with them. It's just the opposite. There's something very beautiful with them. And I invite all uh, your listeners to really breathe into that possibility and then go out in the world and be the most amazing healer, practitioner, friend, lover, wife, husband out there. Great. And what's your website, Dave? It's my name. It's DaveMarkowitz.com. D-A-V-E-M-A-R-K-O-W-I-T-Z.com. We've been speaking with Dave Markowitz, author of Self-Care for the Self-Aware. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. I hope you'll join us next week when our guest will be Dr. Jeffrey Bland. He's an expert in functional medicine, and he's talking about his book, The Disease Delusion, which refers to the notion that you can treat every condition with a specific drug rather than trying to understand the underlying cause and deal with it directly. Fascinating stuff. You won't want to miss it. Well, I hope in the meantime you'll join us on our website at ncreview.com. And if you have any comments or suggestions, you can leave them there or connect with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash NC Review. Well, that's our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you'll join us next week. Until then, I'm Miriam Knight for New Consciousness Review. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. Goodbye.